Good afternoon, and welcome to the Norman Rockwell Museum. Thank you. I'm Jesse Kowalski, curator of exhibitions at the museum and the curator of Eloise and More, The Life and Art of Hillary Knight. An exceptionally fun e exhibition organized. Uh, we're deeply honored to present this retrospective of the artist Hillary Knight, uh, the first of its kind to explore the many facets of Knight's wondrous life and career. It was a pleasure for the museum to review and compile the delightful and meticulously crafted artworks you'll see in the exhibition from thousands of images made by Hillary Knight throughout his lifetime. This exhibition is supported in part by the Max and Victoria Dreyfus Foundation and by all of you, our members, and we thank you. Tonight's program features an interview with Hillary Knight moderated by our director and CEO, Lori Norton Moffitt. A Rockwell scholar and national cultural leader, Lori has been at the helm of the Norman Rockwell Museum for more than three decades, overseeing its growth from a small gallery at the old corner house on Main Street in Stockbridge to the world-renowned Center for American Illustration Art the museum is known as today. Dr. Don Bacigalupi is an expert in contemporary art and he's an art consultant. He's formerly served as director of the Crystal Bridges Museum of Art and is the founding director of the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art in Los Angeles, among other distinguished museum directorships. Uh, now an independent curator, Don, with whom we've partnered on numerous exhibitions over the years, has connected us with Mr. Knight and has graciously offered his talent and assistance in the creation and the planning of this exhibition. And now I am thrilled to introduce Hillary Knight, the celebrity you came to see this evening. A working artist for more than seven decades, Mr. Knight has illustrated everything from <laughs> everything from cartoons to advertisements, fashion designs, and Broadway posters. In addition, he's illustrated more than 70 books written by other authors and written and illustrated over a dozen of his own. He's best known for putting a face to Kay Thompson's unforgettable and forever young Eloise character. As popular today as when they were published in the 1950s, the original four Eloise books have brought joy to millions of readers over four generations. Not content to retire, Knight is currently writing an illustrated memoir titled Hillary Knight Drawn from Life. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speakers. Jesse, thank you for that wonderful introduction and for the exceptional exhibition that we are honored to present at Norman Rockwell Museum for the next three months. Uh, it really was a pleasure to make um, Hillary Knight's acquaintance, and he has invited us to call him Hillary tonight, so we're going to be informal. And I want to thank Jesse for uh, organizing a magnificent exhibition, and I want to thank my colleague, our chief curator, Stephanie Plunkett, with whom I had an incredible adventure at the invitation of Hillary and Don to visit Hillary's New York studio, which was, as many artist studios are, just filled with his life's work and memorabilia, and that was the beginning of the sorting of the materials that then Jesse refined and selected for this exhibition. So uh, there are also materials from California that Don brought uh, or sent our way in working with Hillary from this bi-coastal exhibition that came together um, so very beautifully. So we thank you for coming, and we are exceptionally honored to be presenting the retrospective and life's work of Hillary Knight, an artist uh, whose work is widely known, as, and as with many illustrators, isn't always known by name. But for many of your works, you are known by name, and tonight you're going to be known much farther and wider for the breadth of the work you did over 70 years. So that leads me to my first question. Um, you have enjoyed such a long and prolific career. I wondered if you would share some highlights with us that stand out in your memory of things you really loved about your work. Okay, well, shall I begin? Please. <laughs> in 1926, this book was published. Gucci Goggles <laughs> and his polywog named Woggles. <laughs> so that Classic. was my first view of art, and it was all done by my mother. And what is particularly interesting to me is they're all imaginary people. There, she was a wonderful illustrator and famous in her day. But none of these creatures are anything we've ever seen before. 
And I think that was very much part of what got me going. Uh, to see the world through entirely different eyes. Um, she was what is called a decorative artist, which is opposed to being a fine artist, <laughs> or a serious artist, or a cartoonist. A decorative artist was not really up there. It was sort of down on a level like this. Not really down, but um, she was famous in her little tiny way because of this art. It was everything that I saw when I was growing up in Rosalind around. Um, literally watching her from the beginning, painting and drawing. And, but she was an illustrator the way my father was. The illustration was in the tw late 20s and 30s, hot stuff, you know? It wasn't, yeah. Illustrators were stars. Uh, and the, my family were both very successful at what they did. They did everything. Uh, they were never considered fine artists. They were illustrators. My father took me here um, years and years ago. Um, so it, it, uh, to be back here is a, a, a gigantic honor, thanks to this man who wanted me to be part of this. This is amazing. Amazing. <laughs> it's all for you. I love this work. Uh, how different it was uh, from what I do today. I am. It's bragging. It really is to say I can still do it, but I actually can. <laughs> he can. It's true. <laughs> I prove it to myself a lot. Hillary, I, I just... I am in a, a, a uh, what do we call it? Assistant. For uh, the, the old and infirm. Well, we'll <laughs> say you're in your 10th your uh, decade of life, which is significant. <laughs> um, uh, Hillary, uh, I wanted to mention your parents' uh, names. Your father was Clayton and, Knight, and your mother was Catherine Sturgis. Yes? Yes. Yes. I have to give the full role. <laughs> um, they both, they both, they did two entirely different things. My mo father was a, a pilot in World War I, shot down over Germany. He has well, everything that you saw of, of his uh, was something that he actually lived as a, as a fighter pilot in World War I. Uh, I never felt I had much uh, taken from him. It was basically my mother, because my mother was did this incredibly um, fast fantasy, pure fantasy. My father was exactly the opposite. Um, The fact that I have been able to keep, keep it going, as we say, meaning your brain is working down <laughs> through your hand and you are still absolutely able to draw that line. Uh, that's unusual. I'm not bragging because it's unusual. Oh, 90, yeah. 90, <laughs> 90, 96. Yeah, 96. Okay. Well, Hillary. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> anyway, uh, I am overwhelmed by this, by the, you know, things I've forgotten, things uh, that all the things I really love are in there. That's great. That I really truly love, um, and then I, you know. Um, they're all inspired by lots of people, um, wonderful art directors, 
basically the fact that they were both artists and I was visually constantly reminded of it, taken to my father's studio. My mother worked in the, in the home we lived in. So I constantly saw all this happening. That was a, a vital part of my upbringing. And it went on. My mother worked in New York when we lived in the Manhattan. She worked all the time. And uh, I was always aware of what it was like to be an artist, what they went through, what my father, you know, he, um, he had um, a, a very good reputation as mostly an artist um, having to do with aviation because of his fantastic background. And my mother the same way. My mother did everything. She did uh, a lot of fashion. Um, uh, she wasn't interested in fashion at all, but she worked for Bazaar. She did her fashion drawings for in the 20, uh, in the early, late, forgive me, late 30s, I can't talk. Can, I can remember things uh, that were extraordinary. Um, and they worked all through the 40s, and then it ended with photography and everything. It just, illustration ended. It has squeaked back ever so slightly, but it's not the same as it was. Uh, and it's great, uh, you know, to be with Norman Rockwood's fantastic paintings, you know, uh, to me, uh, a word that's to me very important is style. Style can be a lot of different things. It can be very um, to do with fashion, and that is not what I was interested in. I was vaguely interested. My mother was vaguely interested. She did wonderful costume designs and uh, all imaginative. Uh, and it's, it's, I think it's an essential part of a certain kind of illustration, um, which is what I did. What more can I say? Could you, Hillary, could you tell the story of the very first collaboration that you did with your mother? You told me when you were six or eight years old, your mother's sketchbook around circus themes, the you, circus. you decided it wasn't oh, oh, finished. I'm, I'm actually ashamed of that. She did a <laughs> full of uh, pencil drawings in a circus in Paris, and they must have been lying around. And, Hillary got out his pencils and added to them. <laughs> completed them. You completed them. For a lot of them were girls hanging by their teeth <laughs> in Paris and Paris. And I thought, well, that's, that's a fairly normal thing to be <laughs> by your teeth. Anyway, I was shocked at what I had done to it. And I can't imagine she was really pleased. But it also <laughs> happened with um, her painting. I can remember, as I must have been a really little boy, going up and so she done this huge painting that does not exist anymore of a Chinese lady. And I thought, that looks nice. I had to be about six years old. I was out with all these oil <laughs> And she was very nice about it. She shouldn't have been, but she forgave me. Well, that's one of the things that strikes me is how supportive your parents were oh, of you yeah, were. emerging as an artist at they such were. a young age um, and um, encouraging had, that. Uh, we had a fantastic family. And I had an older brother who is the father of Lily and Kitty <laughs> and Chris, the brother. And um, he, um, what am I saying? Joey. 
Joey, you're talking about Joey. The brain is suddenly atrophy. <laughs> you were talking about Joey. My brother, yeah. He was here, here was in a household of two, not three very different periods and age, all of being artists, all working all the time. And I think it was tough on him, <laughs> uh, as it should have been, you know? He was this wonderful boy that ended up um, being a very, very good uh, filmmaker at a, uh, a aviation company and... Mm -hmm. Martin Company. Yeah. Anyway, um, he was at a loss watching these three people <laughs> turning out this stuff for years. And I think he felt uh, that he should have been part of that and was not. And um, it had, you know, it was, a, it was a tragedy to me that he felt that way, that he felt uh, that there was anything that he was lacking, because mm -hmm. he lacked nothing. He produced these charming people, one of them was not here. Uh, and he died at 39 from smoking. Lesson we should all learn. Uh, But he, you know, I think um, family life, and when when there are so many different um, interests, my father's interest was strictly in aviation. My mother's was this total fantasy. Um, all of that has come back. All of that is part of what I am and what inspired me. Um, what I am, whatever I am, <laughs> you know? Carl, I, you know, I think the fact that we've survived a, a really peculiar time in, in life, uh, devastating, you know? Uh, my brother's death was um, something that, you know, I can never put away. It's always there. Um, but the fact, my mother and father worked most of their life into their semi-old age. I know they died much earlier than me, so I feel I got to carry on. <laughs> you are carrying mm -hmm. on. <laughs> I do. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to ask you about the many kinds of art you have done. You became famous for your Broadway posters, for your book illustrations, and the Eloise series that you partnered with Kay Thompson. Can you talk about the highlights, some of your favorite works in the well, various uh, genres you've done? I have to talk about Kay because, and an even more important person who was a woman named Dee Dee Ryan, Dee Dee Dixon. She was, in, in the 50s, she was my neighbor. Um, she worked for Diana Breland and Harper's Bazaar. She was a, a, a sort of an assistant to Diana Breland, who was the goddess of fashion. Um, and she recognized something in my work that um, she, she was a, a uh, um, she loved to collaborate with people, to, to get other people interested in, in something <coughs> that she felt had some unusual talent. And she had met Kay Thompson. I knew exactly who Kay Thompson was because she was so famous in a very specialized world, which was nightclubs, which don't really exist anymore. <laughs> but she was a major star in a very specialized way. She was unique. There was nobody really quite like her. Uh, there's evidence of, of her work, but not much, you know. 
the most famous thing is uh, Funny Face. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were in the pr process when, when we did Funny Face, when she did Funny Face, I was not part of it at all, but I was, went to Paris where they did the final scenes of it. Um, and uh, she was, um, I'm trying to make it, it's very hard to talk about some extraordinary person, but she, she certainly was. She had um, style that was all invented for her. It was not never her. She was a homely little girl <laughs> from the Saint, uh, from St. Louis, uh, who made herself into this extraordinary woman, and she was absolutely. Um, unique in everything she did, the way she looked and the art she did. Um, her, her, her musicianship, which was what she was, she was a true musician in the late, early 30s. Um, she wrote about, and she wrote a lot of art. She was really famous um, in that period about being an ugly duckling, mm. which she was, definitely was. <laughs> she was not a beauty in any way, but she was. A, she knew how to invent it and make it into something extraordinary. It, a lot of it had to do with a lot of gay men who created this creature. Not, not she was able to know what to take from their teaching. We're talking about uh, Roger Eden at MGM and her real great friend and uh, uh, Noel Cowell. Uh, they all gave her, they added to what she already had. She already had it, like Judy Garland, mm -hmm. always had it. Judy Garland, when she was this big, knew what she was doing. And Kay inherited all that. You know, she was at MGM when, when Garland was before. Uh, she was there after Garland. It was already a star. But she gave her um, style and sort of a gay camp. It's what made Garland this gay idol. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but she had it before. I mean, she had this wonderful, extraordinary personality and knowledge about music. Uh, she apparently never had to do much studying. You know, she would look at some, she made it and be able to rattle it off. Um, it, it sounds like her personality came out in Eloise. And I wonder how she started to write the books and how you learned there how to get in the head of a six-year-old girl <laughs> so beautifully. Uh, her, there were three sisters. They were like the Bosworth sisters who were singers in that period. Uh, she had a pretty sister and two not so pretty sisters. <laughs> they were all in, Music. They were successful as, as like the Boswells, Andrew sisters. Um, and one of the sisters told me that there was always this little girl that she would hear. I don't know that that's true. Hmm. It may be, or it may be some fiction that Kay Thompson invented because she, she didn't want it, it, it was also a period of Baby Snooks, mm. who was, you would have to know who Baby Snooks, mm. Fanny Bryce did Baby Snooks as this little child. Mm. Um, not in any way like Eloise, um, unsophisticated, odd, but funny little, she looked like a little, little child, looked like Fanny Bryce with a great big hair bow. <laughs> 
so it was it was um, it was an original idea borrowed from mm -hmm. something that already existed, mm -hmm. having a, an adult woman talking like a little child. She was not as we call it, child friendly. <laughs> that was not in fact really didn't like them. Well, we all love the mischievous Eloise, and I wonder how you got in the head of a six year old girl. Well, I can tell you exactly. Dee Dee Ryan, who was my neighbor on the same floor, 52nd Street, across from Leon and Eddie's, and 21, lived there all my early <laughs> early life. Um, and Dee Dee saw these drawings I was doing a lot for House and Garden, and they very often involved a very strange looking little girl, <laughs> entirely based on uh, Ronald Searles. Ronald Searles was a terrific British uh, pen and ink artist in, um, in that period. Um, did suffer punch and Lilliput, and they were always about little British schoolgirls, frightful little creatures. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. his work was a real inspiration for me. Mm. Uh, I never denied that. You know, it, tr it truly was. Uh, and I started doing these drawings for House and Garden. I was doing a lot of humorous stuff. And Dee Dee saw this and said, you should do a book about this little girl. She said, I know Kay Thompson very well. She borrowed a fan that I made and took it out to California where they um, she did interviews with uh, Kay, Dee Dee and Kay, and Kay was doing this little voice, and she said, well, you really should do a book on this. And when she is the one, not Kay, Dee Dee is the one that got it all started. Literally, she That's kept great pushing out of it and she said, you've got to do this book, <laughs> and she did, you know. Yeah. So that was, Dee Dee is very important in my life. Very important. A lot of ladies in my life have been inspirations. Um, when I was a little boy, uh, we lived in um, vacation, a summer vacation, in a funny little gulch in Westport, Connecticut, and our neighbor, this is 1937, our neighbor was John Houston and his then girlfriend, a woman named Connie DePennant. And Connie DePennant was a daughter, one of three daughters of DePennant's uh, department store. Yeah. Um, that, that was, sh Connie, saw me in, in this, at this period and called me and told my mother, your child is a genius, <laughs> which was the worst possible thing she <laughs> uh, And I thought, well, that's probably true. <laughs> uh, I, I continued thinking that, you know? So it didn't bother me very much to, to uh, carry it on. I was a genius. So, <laughs> Good. And, um, it, it slowly developed. You know, the book took place, and we had a meeting with Kay Thompson um, in her uh, nightclub in, in the plaza. That's really where it mm. all began. Oh, that's fascinating. So I, I knew all about Kay. I knew who she was and how she had made this tremendous success in nightclubs. Uh, not like anyone else, she had a bunch of boys that danced with her. She was this really uh, spitfire kind of act that was uh, unlike anybody. Um, and that's what she got her, her early 
real fame. She was already a singer on, mm -hmm. on radio uh, in the sort of early 30s. She was already established, Fred Waring, she was on. But she did this totally unique kind of rhyming thing that nobody had ever heard before. Am I right? <laughs> Corroborate. Hillary, I wanted to ask you about, speaking of Connie and Kay perhaps, but there have been a whole handful of muses, of female muses, women that have inspired you, muses that are elegant, glamorous, larger than life performers, some of them here in the audience who have really inspired you. Can you talk about that yeah, well, kind I, of inspiration? You know, I became aware of partly through my parents of a lot of um, extraordinary performers. Yeah. And one was Meilan Fang, and Meilan Fang was this Chinese man who dressed as woman and was really famous. M. Butterfly is based on this real person. Uh, that was something that I knew about and uh, was fascinated with. Uh, from there went to let's see, all exotic. Um, she took me to the movies, and Elephant Boy was a movie as of 1937 with Sabu. <laughs> Sabu, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Ride on an elephant. <laughs> wear too many clothes, <laughs> turbans. I thought well, that. You know, why wouldn't everybody want to do that? <laughs> I seriously thought that. So he was a hero to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Forty-three, uh, thirty-nine. Shabu came um, in 37, Elephant Boy, a documentary that became a, a famous movie and made him a few show. Um, Carmen Miranda hit New York in 1939 and created a sensation. And my family must have taken me to it. <laughs> and I had Nobody had ever seen anything like Carmen Miranda. And I had a good friend, Hugh Martin, who was in it as a chorus person. He said she was on for seven minutes, seven minutes, and created this huge sensation in New York. This is uh, early 40s. Uh, so she became it. Then we're, we're getting more and more exotic, Sabui from India, uh, Common Rand from Brazil. Then I see Lena Horn, mm -hmm. and I thought, wow, <laughs> there, there, there's something. I can remember walking into the Capitol Theater, and there was Lena on the screen, very big screen, black and white. And I thought, so it was all this beginning of this interest in basically exotic people. The fact that they were Indian and black and Brazilian never occurred to me. I mean, there was no distinction about where they were from. They, were, they just projected this fantastic image that I had never seen, most people had never seen before. Well, what I love about the link you make to the visuals you were seeing in New York is to your line and your drawing. Because when I looked through the materials in your studio, I fell in love with your sketchbooks. Mm. And the beauty of your line runs through all of your work, your Broadway posters, your fashion design, your sketchbooks for Eloise. And you talked earlier about how an artist uh, translates from the brain to their hand and the movement of your hand. And could you just talk about drawing and what your sketchbooks help you do and how that becomes the final piece? I think you just have to start with it. I, I really don't know if it- It just happens, huh? Parents <laughs> did it. Uh, for me, 
Uh, I mean, all the exotic stuff was there uh, in my brain, and I loved it. But when I went to the Art Students League, which was just before I went in the service, you know, I had this incredible teacher, Reginald Marsh, who was a fantastic teacher. Lucky you. Uh, <laughs> my Lucky father us. had, um, I gotta say, Bellows. George Bellows. George Bellows. George Bellows. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, Quite a lineage. That was George Bellows, George if you Bellows didn't hear it. Did these incredible paintings of um, prize fights, enormous paintings of, of two fighters. You know, those they're, they're full of action and movement and everything. That that. I must have inherited something from that. His uh, admiration for, he was a great painter. Yes. And, and I think uh, did a lot for um, uh, teaching anatomy and everything. Um, Marsh was a, a very important, he was not only a painter, I don't think of him as a, 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 a I didn't think of him as an artist, a cartoonist so much. Um, and he, I was with him about two years and I learned everything. The whole um, movement of Eloise is partly Piglet. Mm. It truly is. Piglet was a big influence because I loved Piglet when I was a little <laughs> child and I liked uh, but um, Shepherd, right? They were the they were the yeah, real uh, inspirations. I I wanted Aaron to come. Shepherd, 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 the illustrator for um, a Winnie the Pooh. A Winnie the Pooh. A. a Mel. Yeah. That you know, Christopher Robin and Shepherd were what I first saw. Mm -hmm. I think always vitally important to what is going to come out of you later on. Mm -hmm. To be able to look at this little piglet and very interesting, and then Gucci. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, you know, the, the, all of my mother's books uh, had a tremendous influence on me. She had gone to Japan in 1917. I cannot imagine mm -hmm. what it must have looked like. It must have been so incredible. All of her sketchbooks, which were beautiful, are in the Chicago Library. Wow. So I'm sure with that. I'm so glad they were oh, saved. So. Mm -hmm. Um, Don, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, we are fortunate to be here with Hillary and to have his art here in the museum because of your prescience in seeing it, connecting with Hillary, and thinking of Norman Rockwell Museum and our commitment to illustration art. And I'd love to ask you to um, share some of your reflections when you first met Hillary and saw his work. And I know you've written some uh, thoughtful moments about that. So Thank please you. share with us. Well, well, it was a revelation. I knew, as do most of us, uh, the first introduction was through the Eloise books as a child. And I didn't have those books, but I remember them being around. I had an older sister who was born in the 50s, and I think she had them. So I was aware, but I wasn't aware of the breadth and the longevity of this career, this extraordinary maker. So when I first encountered Hillary only in the last five years, it was this revelation. And when I began to examine as an art historian, the depth and the quality of his work, it really spoke to me. And that's when I wrote to you. And I did, I'll read a couple of lines that I wrote about Hillary. I wrote, he's a consummate storyteller and a master of character. His line has the confidence of Ang, of course, an art historian would say that, and the expression of Matisse. His color palette, palettes are exuberant and subtle dazzling and refined. His compositions sometimes rival Rube Goldberg's in their complexity and stunning balance. And his ability to create character out of whole cloth is legendary. 
Even anthropomorphized animals emerge bristling with life, demonstrating all the foibles and idiosyncrasies of human characters. And Knight's sense of humor, in person and in his art, is both wry and dazzling. And that was my experience, both meeting the art, so to speak, and then meeting the artist, and understanding the breadth of what really had to be shown, and in my experience, hadn't been shown in, in, in its entirety. So I applaud you and your team, and I'm thrilled to see this exhibition come to life in really a very short space of time. We began talking only a couple of years ago, and you and I began only talking maybe a year and a half ago. So an extraordinarily fast project, and to have Hillary here with family and friends to see the show is just thrilling. So thank you, and thank you, and thank all of you. Well, we can't thank you enough for making this connection. <laughs> anyone you saw, except it has to do with me. <laughs> Kay was at MGM, where all the great stars were. One of them was Van Johnson. And Van Johnson, I don't know who knows, do you, you know sure. Van Johnson? <laughs> Some of you don't. <laughs> um, he lived nearby. He was a big, tall, blonde, giant juvenile star at MGM, made very impressive movies, he could do anything, was a comic and was a, you know, good-looking leading man. And he lived nearby me, and I was uh, near 2nd Avenue, and on 2nd Avenue was this little tiny ice cream parlor. What would that be? Famous ice cream. And Van Johnson would go there all the time because he would sit in the window. He had a little tiny seat in a window, I think hoping that people would recognize him. <laughs> Forgotten him completely. Except he wore red socks. He all through his life wore red socks. I went in one time. And I see this big, he was very tall, and I looked down, and he had some red sock, <laughs> and he was, or he ordered some, he went and sat down, and I thought, should I talk to him? Because I knew he was fond of Kay, um, he had mentioned that. And I went up to him, I said, Mr. Johnson, he looked up, and he, I said, I'm Hillary Knight. Kay Thompson, Kay Thompson, Kay Thompson. Oh, he said, excuse me. He said, I'm old, I'm deaf, and I'm innocent. <laughs> Hard so to talk we'd about. like to um, just close by asking you what you're working on today. Can you tell us about the book you're working on well, I'm not, today? Well, I have, I've got a lot of books. Yeah, <laughs> the, Lily and Kitty are going to produce one. I did a long time ago um, a calendar, and they're very elaborate drawings that had phosphorescent ink printed on that will not be in this book. But they're all funny little animals mm. that are based on our gang, like Little Shoulder, but the animals. Fun. That we plan to put out. Uh, when I went into the Kensington... Assisted, assisted living? living not the I was not in good shape at all. I was a semi-basket case, and I was, I came from the hospital, and I can remember being carried in by this policeman and dumped into this cradle. It was a bed, at the it's still probably there. It was black imitation Naga hide the back of the whole <laughs> and tufted. But it had the the tufts were anchored by gigantic rhinestone, <laughs> fake rhinestone. It had a, a sway 
back mattress, which was not really a hospital bed. <laughs> they didn't seem to realize that. Anyway, this is one of my uh, memories. And I was literally um, at the mercy of a lot of uh, wonderful nurses there. They, they were mostly Mexican and great women, helpful women. And because I was so old, I couldn't do a lot of things that I had to do, technically. <laughs> and they would clean me up. They cleaned me up, it's you know, a, a nice way of saying it. And I began to feel like a frog. I felt, I felt like this creature that we had in or science class, you know, we had a frog and we just sucked it and flipped it around. And that's exactly what I felt like. And I invented a, because I wanted to draw, but I started out drawing this old man being flipped around in bed and put in the shower with hoses up in various areas. And I thought, that really doesn't look so good. <laughs> I made him into a frog. So he is, he's Sir Percy. And we're, we may produce a book on Sir Percy. But he is a human-sized frog. Well, you know, Norman Rockwell's middle name was Percival. And he sometimes signed it Percy. So we'll close there with you and Norman Rockwell creating just outstanding, beautiful artwork. We're so grateful to have you here today to tell us about it and to showcase your work on the walls of the museum. We thank you so much. <laughs> We I don't think have, they heard that. He said he would be thrilled to answer a question yes, or two. Yes, I was going to say we have time for a question or two if anyone would like to one. Uh, ask one. There's one right up front. Oh, Linda, yes. Thanks. I'll repeat it so everyone can hear it. Okay, I can probably object. <laughs> um, I, I don't have a question, Hillary. I just want to thank you for the influence of your work on my artwork. Um, I, you that, have it's to. immeasurable, and I thank you so much for that, particularly this book. <laughs> Hillary, Linda is a, a renowned artist here in the Berkshires, and she was thanking you for your inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, lots of wonderful, extraordinary things have come of this. Um, when um, I'm using another example, but it's my father's painting is more of the, the cover of the pilot's look. Um, we were in, my mother and my father died and we were in a blah, and raw, um, running Connecticut. And um, I had to empty our very full house. I went in this terrible dump. Um, it was not an antique shop, it was a junk shop. And there was this painting hanging on the wall. And I, you know, I immediately told him what it was, uh, that it was my father's, and his estimate of the price of it went way up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, then this past year, I got a a notice from a woman who said, I have a painting of your mother's, which is called, I'm not sure what it's called. It's this big. Um, it was sold by my mother in probably in the late 40s for $50. <laughs> And she said it, it seemed like a lot of money. It couldn't have. It was this fabulous thing. I now have it. I yeah. own it. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, they're here, the whole family. Uh, 
to rise, whoever you can. Sunny. Above my bed in, in uh, California as soon as I get mm. it. And they have an exchange and artwork. So, <laughs> Lovely. Uh, Does anyone else? Bob. I have a comment. I am so happy to see this low art in this museum, which is no longer low art. <laughs> the illustration art has come a long, long way, and it is so important in the United States today. And I'm so happy that the Rockwell Museum is expanding and expanding. I'm so happy they have their work here today. Thank you very much. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. You know, I, I, am, I was completely unprepared for this. Completely. <laughs> I had no idea that uh, there was so much in it. You told me. It was an extraordinary event that a, a museum like this would want to do something so quickly. Um, you usually wait until I have. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hillary, you might remember I suggested we do this next year because we had an exhibition planned for this fall, and you said, don't wait. I need you to do it right away. So we did it right Words away. Words to live by. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you, Hillary. Oh, thank you. Thank you all and I, all. I know um, Hillary would love to chat with you and so many friends here today. We thank you all for coming and supporting this fantastic artist. Um, we're so honored to present your work, Hillary. And Don, thank you for bringing Absolutely. us together. Happy to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.